everyone and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Venetia. This is the Willy Worker Knitting Podcast and today I'm joining you for episode 30 of the Willy Worker Knitting Podcast. I can't believe it's been four weeks, I think, if the math is right. I didn't mean to. I really hate uh, taking longer than two weeks between podcast episodes because I'm quite productive usually and then it just means that there's so much to remember and also then I get out of practice in terms of podcasting. Uh, skills, I guess. So yeah, this is not ideal and I was kind of realizing that there, there there had been a big gap So I was kind of putting off doing the podcast But then there were some projects that I'm working on that I was keeping in a certain way for the podcast So I was stopped in my tracks and that's not ideal. So today we are podcasting I'm sorry in advance if any of this is rambly or if I can't remember details correctly or if there's a lack of finished item photos I just thought that if I was waiting for everything to be perfect, there just wouldn't be a podcast episode. So yeah, let's take this one a bit more chill than usual and I hope that you still enjoy it. I know that I'm still going to enjoy sharing my progress on my knits, get your opinions on some questions and just spend a lovely time talking about knitting and then reading your comments afterwards. So yeah, today there will be four finished items, one main whip, which is my yellow card again, and I can't wait to show you what that looks like if you've been watching me on Instagram, you probably already have seen a couple photos a couple of weeks ago. And then I think maybe a couple of plans that I want to talk about. And then there's not really going to be a life update or uh, big plans for the future. So yeah, like I said, it's going to be quite chill. If you want to follow me on Ravelry, Instagram, you can find me at The Woolly Worker, same as here on YouTube. If you want to support the channel, you can support me on Ko-fi or Ko-fi for just the price of a cup of coffee, or you can buy me a pattern from my Ravelry wishlist. It's always really appreciated. And if you want, you can also join the Discord. We recently had a knit night there that was lovely. Lots of new faces that hadn't come to previous knit nights and uh, lo lots of chat there. So definitely join me on my socials if you want. And then if you want to, you can navigate through timestamps in the video and also check the description below for any details about Ravelry projects, designer, color names, etc, etc. I think you know the drill. Um, so we'll start with what I am wearing, which is one of my finished items, and then we'll move on to the other finished items and the one whip. I'm really excited because I've really been finishing things like crazy, which also has a drawback, which I will talk about later. But yeah, this is the Friday Tea by Petite Knit. It took a while, I think around six weeks to do. Um, the beginning was quite laborious when you were increasing for the raglan. It was just a lot of stitches to have. It's fingering weight. I did mine on 2.75 millimeter needles, wooden, which was nice, I guess. Um, for me personally. It was a non-superwash merino. This is Sunday by Sandis Garn. Uh, the colors will be in the description. The green is a normal color and the white is whipped cream by the Petite Knit sort of collection. So it was taking a while and then I split her sleeves which felt like amazing. The sleeves went really fast, the neck went really fast and then I just had miles and miles of body. At some point I had sort of calculated that it would take me X number of stripes but I don't know why I had actually calculated that wrong and it turned out I still needed to do like four afterwards. So that, that set me back. And then I had to do the ribbing afterwards, which the main pattern is broken rib. So you've got one round of ribbing and one round of plain stockinette. It's not too bad because you're always kind of looking forward to that stockinette round. But then for the ribbing at the bottom of the sleeves and the body, it was just like, that's only ribbing. Uh, my modification is that for the ribbings, I actually went down the needle size. Petite Knit recommends just using the same that you use for the body, but I know that my ribbing is really loose, so I just didn't really want the ribbings to flare. So I did that. I did the tubular bind off for once. Usually I kind of just do sewn bind off, but I was feeling like I wanted it to be neater, and I think it worked. I was saying in the previous video that sometimes my sewn bind off can be really, really odd looking before block, and usually again, I have a tendency to be loose which means that it's ripply um, and then I, I block it out because I basically increase the width of the ribbing and then that becomes even with my bind off. But I was thinking if I was doing the tubular bind off with the two set up rounds and if I was paying attention to making sure I was making the set up rounds tightly, that could sort of pave the way for a tighter bind off and I think it worked. It makes my bind off a little bit more cinched in while staying incredibly stretchy and it doesn't flare. So I'm probably going to lean back now towards doing tubular bind offs. I guess it, it works for me. Um, I really liked the fit of this Friday tee before block. Uh, I was I was feeling so proud, so achieved having finished it, blocked it, took all the precautions not to stretch it out. 
it still increased massively. I took the measurements before, I didn't take them after, um, but I can tell, I mean, it used to almost have like, neg I think it had negative ease, and now it pretty much, I would say, yeah, at least 10, 15 centimeters now of positive ease. And so there's a few issues, I guess. So one is that, yeah, it has too much positive ease. The yolk depth is longer. So I'm getting a bit of the bat sleeve effect. And then the worst part is I had actually done a modification, which I talked about in the previous episode. I had made my sleeves one repeat shorter than recommended in the pattern. So I should have had one more white stripe. I was happy I had removed it because then it fell at a good enough length on my upper arm. But now, sadly, with the block, um, and you can't really see it here because I'm stretching it out, but when my arms are down, basically it has stretched out to the point where the ribbing hits me exactly in the elbow. Really, really not ideal. If I hadn't made my modification, it would be even lower than that, which I think would still be very uncomfortable. What I should do now is probably remove one or even two repeats. I just can't believe it grew so much. And before anybody asks, no, I didn't gauge swatch. Yes, this is my fault. I'm reaping what I sowed, that's fine. Um, but yeah, it, it's so annoying. You can already tell that this is gonna crease because of the fact that when I wear it, it's it's gonna just fold. So this is really not ideal. Look at how much space I've got in the arms as well. It just, it's, it's just too big. So I did a size, I did a size small. What I should have done with the same gauge was doing an extra small. I didn't. What I could do in terms of fixing things is, uh, put an elastic in the neck. I'm also not a fan. I really, really like the big raglan. I, I really like that. I love the kind of angles that it provides. Like the, the shaping is really interesting looking visually, but what it does create is this kind of angular neckline. I wish it was rounder, but that's just, I guess, the pros and cons of having such a big raglan. I don't think there's anything that we could have done, <laughs> me or the designer, to make this neckline rounder. But um, it has, again, yeah, stretched out with the block and maybe if I put an elastic, which Petit Knit recommends, it could cinch in a little bit more. It's really not bad for a neckline. I think for a t-shirt especially, um, I wouldn't even, I, I don't actually mind that much. It just feels like this garment has lost all structure. It's rib already, so it's loose. Um, my gauge is looser and the the blocking has made it looser so it's just it's just a really really loose garment and i think elastic in the neck possibly the sleeve could just add a bit of structure which would make it more comfortable what i could do as well then is of course crop the sleeves i'm thinking either surgery and then i would graft it later with the kitchener stitch which is a bit tricky because as i said it's broken ribs so i'd have to make sure that my kitchener stitch is in that stocking it round so I would pick up on the rib round before and after cut and then Kitchener. It's going to be surgery indeed. Or because the sleeves are not that many stitches, circumferences, I could just undo everything. And I finished this quite a while ago, so I'm not even feeling like it's too soon. I could just um, unpick and uh, frog the ribbing, frog a couple of repeats and then do the ribbing again. That probably would take as much time as the surgery like yeah I don't want to do either to be honest neither option is looking more attractive to me but if I want a t-shirt that I like I might have to do it and one of my resolutions this year was to take more time to actually do the things around knitting that would make clothes that I really like so yeah um and then for the body I had also cropped the body and it has grown yeah, a lot. Uh, it's not what I wanted. I wanted something that I wasn't going to tuck in. It would just fall where my high-waisted shorts and everything would hit. Um, now I'm thinking that I either have to accept that it's longer and now I wear it tucked, which is fine, um, or I do the same thing as the sleeves where I either unwind and frog everything or do the, the sweater surgery. Um, or I just give up on everything and just wear it very loose and oversized as is. It's just not what I wanted. So it's tricky. I, I don't want to give the impression that I don't like it. I still love it. I love the, the colors. Like the color is definitely what I love. The texture as well. I don't have a lot of textured knits, like all over texture. I'm, I'm quite, um, 
it downs me to have something that I'm gonna have to work on really hard for the whole of the project with no respite. For example, my Alder sweater, which is one of my favorite knits and one of my most strikingly beautiful ones, is all over texture, like mosaic, slip stitches, knitting, uh, two colors. And, and yeah, it really catches the eye and people love it on me and I like it. Uh, it was just a lot of work. So this is also in that category of this was all over texture and, and it's worth it. It's, it's really worthwhile. It looks great and the work has paid off. So I like the texture, I like the color, I don't love the fit. But it's not unwearable, it's just, it's, it really wasn't what I was going for, so maybe I just have to wear it a few times and see if I can make it work. I haven't been able to wear it out yet because since finishing this, the weather in Scotland has taken the worst turn and it's been raining so much, so... On the, on the positive side, it having positive ease means uh, it's less likely that I'll be sweating buckets in it and it's not going to be skin tight because this is, after all, still merino. So, yeah, I, I think it's definitely comfortable to wear it inside the house. So I, I probably will still maybe wear it inside the house to see if I can get used to this shape on me as opposed to the shape I was um, visualizing when I was trying it on while it was unblocked, where it was really body fitting. It's just a different t-shirt. But yeah, let me know what you think. I mean, I don't know if I'll be able to get photos. I, I hope so, and if so, they will have been on screen. Let me know what you think of this fit on me. Does it look ridiculously oversized? Does it look like I did it wrong? Or can I pull it off and it, it looks all right? <laughs> um, let me know, because I don't mind making other t-shirts that are negative ease fitting. Like, that's the plan, I guess. I have a lot of t-shirt plans plugging my uh, previous video right here where I talk about t-shirts. So, yeah, the cost of this then with Sunday Scar on Sunday, it was pretty much less than four balls of the green and less than one ball of the white. Uh, didn't have any extra, was really happy with my yarn management, and it cost um, £27.42, which is really good for something. That's what you get with fingering weight. Uh, you get so much more midrange for your buck, and yeah, that's why they take so long, but they, they cost less. So, really happy with this quality and matrix that you get for the price. I think Sunday is one of my favorite yarns for sure. So I think, I think that's it for that. Uh, let me know what you think and let's move on to the next finished item which is another t-shirt and I was actually wearing that in my um, t-shirt video that just came out. This is the Moonset Tea by Ozetta and here it is. Um, yeah, I, I love this. This is really really great and I think I, I do prefer the fit on this. Maybe it's because again I, I didn't have um, expectations. If anything, the problem with this one, when I tried it on way before uh, blocking it, is that it felt really tight and I was hoping it would loosen with block. And it did. So this is the reverse of this story. But um, yeah, uh, keen-eyed viewers will remember that this was a work in progress last year, but basically back in June. I think I cast, it, I cast this on in May or June last year, and it is the tiniest gauge I've ever worked with. Um, I'm using Meadow by The Fibre Company, which is technically a lace weight yarn. So yeah, I was doing that on 2.75 millimeter as well, but because the yarn is thinner and it wasn't rib, my gauge is definitely thinner. I can't remember what the gauge is exactly, but this is pretty much the tightest I've ever knit. Um, and yeah, it was just... The beginning is a really fun construction. You do something quite interesting with the button band. You get that nice little V. Ozetta has a bunch of patterns using that moonset feature. There's like the moonset pullover, moonset vest. Uh, this is the T. A lot of people have done it in knitting for olive pure silk. And honestly, if I were to make a second one of these, that is what I would use. So this in construction is really interesting. It's a drop shoulder. So this is what the back looks like. And as you can see, or maybe not, there's that tiny little back pickup edge, which I think I did a great job with it. The yarn does a great job at making it seamless. Um, I, I really, really like how the back looks. It's just really, really smooth and clean. And then the sleeves obviously weren't that hard to do. They were really short. I don't think there were any decreases or maybe just a couple. And then it was an I-cord bind off. So all that to say that the beginning of this top was fun and not too time consuming. But then came the body. <laughs> and this is this is my my Odyssey. This this was just so much stock in it. Um I think the original calls for twelve inches after the split. And some people were like doing it for eight inches, but that was really, really short. 
then I was maybe aiming for 10 inches. I can't remember what I did, but it'll be on Ravelry. And uh, because I just had so much time to work on this and I shelved it for ages, I also decided to make a modification of having a folded hem. And I love that. I think this is one of my best decisions of the entire year. It was making this folded hem on this t-shirt. It's such a great summer detail. Like it really makes it scream summer as opposed to like jumper. I think it works really well with the V, like, I know that this is technically ribbing, and then we have an I cord, and we have a folded hem, so technically all three finishings are different, but I really don't think that this is all over the place, it feels very cohesive, um, and, and yeah, I really like it, I don't regret not doing it on the sleeves, like, I think this is just really great, and I highly recommend it. The folded hem was easy, I just reached the length that I wanted to do, did one purl round, did um, pretty much... 10 or 11 rows of stockinette, like basically aiming for an inch of fabric to fold back. Then I bound off very loosely in stockinette, in knit stitch. Then I went with a needle and I um, sewed it with the edge on the inside. And I used a video from Park Williams, I'll link it below, it's also linked on my Ravelry. It's so easy to follow, really easy to see. She describes um, how to follow the line so you're making sure you're sewing it on the exact same round and you're not um, misaligning. That was really fun. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I hope you can get the excitement I had from making this folded hem. The only thing is that it took me so long to get there. Another modification that I did, which really, like, who cares? <laughs> I made a, a pearl round faux seam. I think that this shows, yeah, you can see there's like a line here. It's very subtle. Only I know it. Um, it was kind of interesting, I guess, to, to have that, to, to separate the, the sea of stockinette. I think my reasoning for that was that the yarn itself, meadow, is quite, um, I think, a loose ply, which means that it has a tendency to lean or twist. And so um, in my gauge swatch and even in the resulting fabric, maybe it's looking a little slanted. And I thought that a pearl seam, even though it's a faux seam, would add a little bit more stability and make sure that my entire body wouldn't end up extremely twisted because the twist would compound. So I think it's fine. Um, the yarn itself, Meadow, uh, it was always my dream to make, to use it and to, to make this t-shirt in this color. I had seen a project on Ravelry that was like that, so I just wanted to do the same thing. In retrospect, I don't know if it's the color for me. It's very autumnal, you know, hay, um, field of grass, kind of, yeah, it's, um, Oh, the color is prairie, yeah. So yeah, I, I don't know why I thought that this was gonna be the color for me. I like the idea of it, I guess, more than I liked the color itself. Meadow has a lot of other colors that I think would have suited me better. But when I was wearing that last episode, a lot of you guys said that it looks good, so that gave me a bit more um, enthusiasm about it. I am such a sheep <laughs> when it comes to, to having my own opinions, but that's fine, I don't mind. Um, I, I, I really like it. I think the yarn itself is really great. It's a mix of merino, alpaca, no, merino, llama, silk, cashmere, linen. Maybe not cashmere, um, but just check it out on Ravelry. It's a really, really interesting fabric and blend of fibers. It's extremely drapey. It's not too warm because of the merino or the llama. It's, it really feels so cool to the touch. It is stretchy and bouncy. The linen adds texture. I don't know if you can see the little flecks of white. That's just the undyed linen. It's not scratchy at all. Like it really is one of the least scratchy fabrics I had. I had Drops Bell last year, which I didn't like and found too scratchy. And someone mentioned that might've been because of the linen content. This one, I guess the linen is just less intense. Um, the silk, I guess you can kind of see because this yarn looks really shiny. The ply is loose, so um, yeah, the stitches are looking quite plump. I think it does fluff up a bit with the block. Um, it did loosen up with blocking, which is what I was counting on due to the, the kind of merino aspect of it. And I think that this will also spring back quite nicely when I re-block it, because this is a t-shirt, I'll probably be washing it much more frequently than sweaters, and I'm not worried about it losing its shape over time. I think that every time I'll put it in water, it'll just, you know, yeah, the memory of it will be great. So, yeah, I, this is a success. I'm happy. I wore it in the past video. I still haven't worn it outside because <laughs> of the aforementioned bad weather, but I'm really happy that I'm entering this uh, summer season with not one, but two t-shirts, and I think they will be more handy for me than camisoles will. 
I'll put this down. <laughs> this uh, took me less than two skeins of meadow. It's quite an expensive yarn, so that's what I was after. I didn't want to spend too much money on, on meadow. Sometimes people buy one ball of it to make a shawl. I guess I can recommend that too, because I think it's a yarn that's worth trying out and exploring. But if you're a very tight knitter, then I don't know what gauge you're going to be able to achieve on that and whether you're willing to sign up for this kind of project. I mean, um, yeah, a lot of people have said when I shared this in my stories that they wanted to make it, but they were worried it was going to take a while. Everybody on Ravelry says that it takes ages. I can confirm that it took so so long. It took a year. And, and I wasn't, I was never motivated to, to, to pick it up. Like it wasn't that fun to work on at the end, but the result is so amazing. So it really would be something more of a product knit. And I can recommend that. I, I don't want to make it again for myself, but I would say if you really like the finished object, then go for it and, and it'll be your baptism. So the cost for this was £36.88. Again, when I calculate my prices, I always calculate it to the meter, to the gram, and I take into consideration whether I got the yarn on sale or not. So that's why my prices look the way that they do. If you're new here, I've been documenting and calculating prices since pretty much the beginning of the podcast um, last year, and I think it's really useful to get a good idea of, I guess, what my range is for a, a, a hat, a sweater, a pair of socks, and a t-shirt and a camisole. So, so far, yeah, my t-shirts are pretty much around 30 pounds, uh, which is cheaper than my sweaters. But like I said, it's because they're usually in fingering. Um, so anyway, I think that's everything for the Moonset tea. I'm really glad that it's finished. This featured in a video I made some time ago uh, around my unfinished works in progress, abandoned whips. And uh, then I have good news because the next finished item is another project from that video. I was able to finish uh, a few things from that video and I'm looking forward to then updating you on that because some of them were frogged and some of them were finished. So yeah, we've done gr great strides since that video came out. <clears throat> so the next project then is the Season Sweater by Ozetta. And here it is. This is kind of a complicated color to show. I mean, Instagram, I, I shared it on Instagram and I really liked how detailed that close-up shot was. So I'll definitely be putting photos there of the yarn because the yarn is, is really amazing. So uh, Season Sweater by Rosetta, it's in Half Fisherman's Rib. I made one huge modification to this, which is that I knit it inside out because in Rosetta's pattern, the way that she makes her pattern, you do that whole fisherman's rib of, you know, knitting below. And then on the rest round, you purl all around. That meant that there was going to be a lot of purling and I didn't want that. So I decided to, well, I saw one personal rivalry say that she did it inside out and it worked for the same reason that, that I wanted to do that too. So I took her success as a, a confidence boost and I did it inside out. I cast on at the neck, I did the folded neck. No, I didn't. No, that's what Ozetta recommends. But I actually just cast on at the at the cast on, and I started working inside out. I think I did my short rows. I think I did everything inside out, actually. Yeah, I think I did everything inside out. Later on, I picked up for the neck. I did the modification of doing twisted rib details. So as you can see, the it's it's all twisted rib um, at the sleeves and at the body. I really really like how the twisted rib looks, um, flowing from the half fisherman's rib. So anyway, I picked up for the neck and did that. Then afterwards, when I reached the end of the body, I then did a German short row turn to do my twisted rib the right way up so that I would be only doing um, knitting through the back loop instead of purling through the back loop. You can't tell at all that there's a German short row anywhere. So that's great. The, 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 the main difficulty I encountered with this basically was uh, the sleeves because I, what I decided to do then is that I, I finished the body all inside out. I then flip it the right way up again and I pick up for the sleeve and then I do a couple of rounds to establish the pattern and then I turn it inside out again, do a German short row turn. And so now I'm working the sleeve the same way I was working the body. For my size, there were a couple of decreases to do. And the decreases in Hal Fisherman's Rib to maintain the pattern, you need to decrease two at the same time. So, so we're thinking knit three together or slip, 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 knit, basically. But you're wanting to do that 
whilst keeping the health fisherman's rib knitting below etc Ozetta has a really great video and written description of the decreases that she was asking you to do the right way up for the fabric I tried so hard to think about what that would mean for me with my fabric inside out and the reverse of this I asked on Instagram I actually got 50-50% answers I was asking people you know what's the reverse of a knit three together on the wrong side it was just so complicated because you have to consider not only the left and the right lean of a stitch but also whether you're coming at it from the left or from the right uh, and sometimes people even uh, abbreviate uh, a purl three together like or they say it's a right leaning purl decrease as in it is right leaning from the right side as opposed to like it's a right leaning from the wrong side anyway not trying to confuse you but this is just to say that this was just insane and in the end I did attempt to mirror and reverse things to hopefully get uh, something that looked great from the right side and it didn't work I, I looked at it after a few rounds and it just I met I messed something up it wasn't working so I ended up frogging that and deciding I would just go for balloon sleeves so that was an obstacle that I had kept in mind from the start was how was I going to do my sleeve decreases and in the end I couldn't so I didn't so I did my balloon sleeves, I did the length that Ozetta asked for, even a little bit more I think, just to be sure. Then I again was faced with the decision to emphasize my balloon sleeve, I would heavily decrease the last round and go one needle size down for the cuff. Ozetta says to keep the same needle size. At first I kept the same needle, no, at first I went down the needle size and I didn't decrease, but that was a very wide cuff. So I ripped back and I decreased and I, I'm pretty proud of the way I did it. I pretty much, for all the columns of knits, I joined two together and then left one alone. And then I joined two together. So I think that this looks nice and natural, the way that it flows, the, the columns. I don't know if you can see that, but basically every other pair joins into one. So I felt proud of that. That was a little design element. So... You can see all the color variation. At first I was worried. I used three skins of Surrey, or you know, two and a half. I was worried that you could tell that one of them was maybe a bit more on the blue side of variegation. But I think that the color distribution is really, really great in this. Let me know if, if you think otherwise, I guess, if you're noticing some, some pooling, because maybe I'm, um, I guess, too close to the issue to see it. Um, I, I'm really really pleased with the yarn, I guess I'll talk about that. This is the Rerum Natura Gilead in Quartz and Pigment and Ply in The Triumph of Time, I think, which was a Surrey, um, I think it was 300 meters per ball. So this was extremely attractive in terms of yarn quantities. I used less than four balls of the Rerum and less than three balls of the Surrey, yet this was still a very expensive sweater. I'll just check what the price was. The total cost for this was £104.56. So I think this might be the most expensive sweater of the year so far. Um, I will correct myself. Actually, I'm wrong, yeah. The most expensive was, was the Sonia sweater, which was £108. And that one I am frogging <laughs> because I didn't like it and it was way too expensive to have something that I don't like. So this is my second most expensive sweater, but I guess the most expensive sweater that is staying intact. Um, and it is, of course, because of the hand dyed cost, and the Rerum is not cheap either. But um, I absolutely love the mix of a worsted and a Surrey, although this is really heavy, even though it doesn't use much yarn. It is very dense as well, but I'm, I'm happy that there's no holes or gaps in my Half Fisherman's rib fabric. Um, it's extremely squishy. It, it, like, the squish is amazing. The color mixing, I'm happy. I was maybe hoping this would be a little pinker and instead it's a little too peach but that's because of quartz from the Rerum Natura they have a lot of shades and they have a lot of lovely shades but sometimes they just don't have that like in between color like they have a lot of greens but they they don't have that specific green that I would like so yeah I, I just wish that this was a little less peach and um Like, it's just a little too warm for me. I wish this was a, a colder color. But I still think it works great. I really wonder what this would have looked like had I paired this with a banana yellow or a 
uh, blue, which is the other things, the other colors that were shining through this uh, hand dyed Surrey. So it really depends on, on that choice. Or of course I could have done a white base with the variegated Surrey. But I think that this fabric, Half Fisherman's Rib, works amazingly well for variegated yarns and speckles. Y if you're worried about something being too busy, I don't think that it, that this is. I think that this is really great and the kind of breaking up of the fabric means that maybe it's less likely that it pulls, but I could be wrong with that. Don't take my, my word for it. Um, the thing I'm not the happiest about with this, I guess, is just um, they, they were short rows, so that's great. They were easy to follow. They were the hardest part of the pattern because then the rest of the pattern, like I said, really has no shaping. The sleeves were straight, body was straight, and the raglan it was ages ago, so maybe I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was literally just increase every other raglan or er every other row until you reach the number of stitches for the bust circumference and sleeve circumference. So when I was laying this down to dry, it was basically, as you can probably tell, a, a, a T. So it's kind of unnatural, isn't it? Because our bodies aren't a perfect T. And it just feels like it doesn't fall the nicest at the armpits, I will say. Um, I will maybe put a photo of me wearing this. But yeah, I just I don't love the fit of this on the armpit. I like that it's cropped. I think that's a cute look. I like the balloon sleeves. It's quite a statement jumper. The other thing I was worried about was that first I had sewed down the neck too tightly and I could put it over my head, but it was really uncomfortable to do so and not if I had any headwear on. Um, so I asked on the stream what I should do and people told me to block first before making any big decisions. In the end, I undid it and I just bound off with a larger needle size and then that was enough after block as well. So I'm happy I did that. It didn't, I didn't have to undo my, my whole ribbing. It was really just the bind off that I had done too tightly. Um, I always do the, the knitted bind off where I knit, uh, knit together the edge and the last round and then I pass it over to bind it off for every other stitch. So for a ribbing, which is knit one, purl one, I knit together all my knits and then the purls, I just bind them off. So I think that gives a lot of stretch. So so yeah, that was good to have fixed that problem. So yeah, I think the, the biggest success with this jumper is definitely the fact that even though I used the hand dyed, the color distribution is chef's kiss, perfect. Um, I wasn't playing yarn chicken or anything. Um, yeah, I think this, this looks really, really good and I'm happy it's done. I, there wasn't really a reason why I stopped working on it. I think I just had so many sweaters cast on at the same time, at the same level of progress. Like I had four yokes at one point. It was really funny, I took a photo of what that looked like. So of course one of them had to get um, neglected. But a lot of you were even asking like months later, oh, where's that season sweater? Here it is. And this, I, I love the fabric so much. I just think I'm probably going to make the season cardigan by Ozetta. Uh, maybe even in the same yarn combination, just in a cardigan form. Is that uh, over the top? Um, yeah, I think the cardigan maybe will fall nicer than the sweater because if it's open and looser, maybe the bunching at the underarm won't bother me. Or am I silly to sign up for a project that I know I probably won't like the underarm shaping of? Actually, I was looking at other brioche or half fisherman's rib cardigans because there's a million out there. And I was actually thinking of doing the November jacket by Petite Knit. I've always had this on my list because of the kind of uh, shaping you do at the back, which is the same as the Agnet cardigan, which I also want to do. Um, but the November jacket is a larger gauge and I think that I was actually swatching with the Rarum Natura. So this is, this is the rest of my quartz. Uh, I started a swatch and it's a different fabric actually because this was half fisherman's rib this is full brioche and in full brioche i was really surprised you're actually doing the yarn over slip one every round as opposed to having a round of resolving them i wasn't expecting that i think for the other brioche projects i had done it was half brioche then so this is really this is a really dense fabric and i think what this does is that it doesn't have a right or wrong side of brioche and um you're getting that kind of look on both sides of the fabric. You can see that this looks the exact same no matter what direction um, I'm showing this. So 
this is really slow growing. I mean, um, basically, yeah, it takes a lot to to reach height. And I might abandon this swatch because I'm already not on gauge. I need to go down a further needle size. But yeah, so uh, a lot of people have also complained about the November jacket taking ages to do. So I guess we're signing up for another big project. But I really, really like the look of brioche and how fisherman's rib and this sweater just confirms that there is no way in hell I can wear this anytime soon but it is finished so I'll be happy to have it in September when it gets colder and the last finished item is um, kind of a little surprise I guess it's um, the it's a sample net for giddy yarns uh, I finished my lento last episode and I showed you that um, this hand dyer is in Scotland and she um, sells beautiful yarns and she was just asking if anybody was uh, willing or ready to do some some sample knitting she had a couple of socks, hats, and shawls that she was looking for help with, and I signed up for the hat. So she sent me a couple of her yarns. Um, it's not a secret because they're from yarns she already has. So this is a Tinkerbell from the kind of Peter Pan collection, and then this is um, Shimmer, I think. Uh, and yeah, this is a Surrey, this is a merino sock nylon base and she gave me a pattern to do and it was a hat by Melody Huffman I can't remember the name but it will be down on the description and on screen and this is it! It's looking really small, it's unblocked it's just a combination of knits and pearls so uh, it's quite stretchy actually uh, lengthwise because the um, you know when you do garter that looks really scrunched in but you can then pull it so yeah, the fabric is just a lovely kind of wave pattern and the fabric I got by using the Merino Double and then the Surrey, so kind of like a DK plus Surrey. So it is quite a thick fabric, but uh, I went down the needle size because my gauge is usually really um, loose and I didn't want to have any holes and gaps. I'm really happy with my fabric. This is really soft, really squishy. I'm going to block it later and then I'm going to send that off in the post for... I think she's probably hoping to have these for shows. She does a lot of festivals in Scotland. So if you see her, definitely go check it out. Maybe you'll see this hat um, hanging about. And um, it was nice for me to do this experience of sample knitting once again. I've thoroughly enjoyed both of my sample knitting experiences and it has helped solve my problem of loving to knit but not loving all the extra items that it gives me and having to find a place for them in my flat. Nothing to say about the pattern really, it was a one size pattern, it comes charted and then there's a bit of written instructions for the crown decreases. So yeah, really simple project, it didn't take me long at all. If anything it was just uh, finding the motivation to do it but the deadline for the sample knit was more than ample enough and I have a little bit of yarn left over. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to give this to my friend Jo from Designs Made by Jo. If anything, I'm not going to tell her. And Jo, if you're watching this video, I'm giving you this next time I see you. <laughs> and I'm going to keep the Surrey because this color is actually totally up my alley. And um, I can probably find a, a little scarf or uh, another hat to do this with, like an Oslo hat. Unless I've, I've been burned before, actually, with overestimating how much fluff I have for an Oslo hat. So probably, yeah, maybe some mittens or a little scarf with a Surrey. Um, and this is for Joe. So yeah, that was the, the finished item, a little hat for, for a sample knit. Very satisfying. So I think that's it for all my finished items. And in terms of whips, I really just want to talk about one and is my yellow cardigan. It is it is the, the best thing that, ha that ever happened to me. I'm, I'm really happy. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, let's talk about... Let's talk about feelings first. So I started this two, four weeks ago because I had just gotten the last ball that I needed to complete my collection, the Infinity Stones. It was Dog Rose. And I was really happy to find it at the Yarn Festival, Willy Good Gathering. I cast it on like so soon um, as kind of a reward for, for the big, heavy, like busy weekend. It was like, let's start over, let's do a new project. Let's, let's start the Magnum Opus. And I only had one needle that was appropriate. It was my 2.5 millimeter needle for socks. So I think it's 80 centimeters cable and it was fixed. And I quickly realized after casting everything on that uh, that was gonna be too small a needle and my stitches were way too scrunched up. So I did like three rounds or four rounds, ordered new needles. And then while I was waiting for the needles to arrive, I didn't want to work on the cardigan in case my gauge would change significantly uh, if I had less or more room on the cable. So I had to stop myself even though I was so eager. And in the meantime, I was doing a lot of research on the cardigan itself and about modifications and, and how to 
approach the difficult um, sections later because it's a bottom-up cardigan so most of, the, of it at the bottom which you will see in a second is just really easy just follow the chart x number of times and, and build it up needles arrived i was so excited i had never been more excited waiting for a parcel in a long time and then um, then it was working great then i was doing it on my 2.5 millimeter needles working up the chart chart is really easy to follow um, I was replicating the color scheme of another podcaster, uh, Isabella from um, 100 Acre Wool. She had given the color names in her description. There were a couple of discrepancies where I noticed that I don't think that's what she meant. So I corrected it to what I thought was right. Um, and, and so I followed that. And then and then I, I so quickly reached the end of that main chart. Or I guess, no, the, the, the band chart. The main chart is what I haven't done yet. And I, I reached the end and I, I took a photo and videos of it before block. I blocked it and then I took some videos and photos of it after block and I put it on that big cable uh, where I could finally see it really shine and, and be the length that it was because even though the new needles I got were bigger, the cable, they still were, you know, it was still smaller than the total circumference of the item. So once I was blocking it, I finally realized how big it was. And it, it is big. It is too big, I will say. I think at this point I'm reaching basically the um, large, like medium, yeah, the large size. Because I'm doing the size small to medium, then there's large, extra large, and then I think there's 2XL. So sadly, I think I'm not doing the size that I was supposed to do. The first size was already very oversized. And I, I just can't understand, you know, why why can't I reach a gauge of 29 stitches? Mine is like 26. So that's the first bump on the road, was realizing that this was really large and I technically already had a problem on my hands. And then the second problem was that because that was on the cable and there's like a million stitches on it, so it took a while to get on the cable, it's going to take a while to get it back on the needles, I didn't want to, to go back and forth, and I also really wanted to, to document this magnum opus as thoroughly as possible with you guys. I don't want to just show you a cast on in one episode and then five months later show you that it's done. I really wanted to, to talk about things as they were happening, especially because I didn't want to forget things. And then because I wasn't podcasting, then I wasn't working on this. I was saving my Yale cardigan for the podcast. And that was kind of a negative association to make because... At sometimes I was having a bit of a knitting slump and I didn't know what to work on. And if anything, sometimes what I really needed was something difficult to work on and engaging for my mind. And the yellow cardigan would have scratched that itch really well and it would have been what I uh, could have worked on to, to, to help me and, 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 and fulfill me. But I couldn't because I, I didn't want to put it back on the needles and I wanted to only talk about this first part because there, there was, I guess, some, some stuff to talk about already. I didn't want to overwhelm you or me with tales of um, 50 different things having happened to this card again. So yeah, that was annoying and I don't really know what the solution is because I, it's just pros and cons, like either I, it, it's just pros and cons. So. All that to say that now I am finally podcasting and I'm so glad to be doing so and I can finally show you, I've been talking about this for five minutes, I can show you what I have, we can all marvel and wonder at how great it is and then once that video is, I mean once I'm done recording I am putting this back on the needles and I am continuing which I've been wanting to do for two weeks. This was off the needles for two weeks even though I had the drive and the motivation so it's not great that I um, stopped myself. So I will show you the back first because it looks the best and then the front. Ta-da! So this is it. As you can see, it's already rolling. Um, this is it after a block, but um, yeah, it, it really wants to roll because this is literally all stuck in it. If you've not watched the previous podcast, I did the modification of starting with a provisional cast on instead of the moss stitch. So the moss stitch would have offered some uh, balance and structure over here already, but I didn't do that. What I'm going to do is a folded hem, just like my moon set. I, I really think it's it's working great for me. It's a bit more modern than the traditional fair isle. I think maybe it's going to be a bit weird to have folded hems. It, it doesn't feel like something that um, they would have done traditionally, but I think that that'll be the best way to avoid um, curling and folding and flipping is a folded hem. 
So we'll do that later. But in the meantime, here's what we've got. We've got that entire chart, we've got that first motif, and then little bands of different color works, the big flower motif, which I love, and then three other little bands here. It's really, really great. It has blocked beautifully. The stitches are perfect, in my opinion. My floats are great. The tension is great, even though it's not on gauge. Um, there's no holes or gaps or unevenness. Um, I, I always say that Jameson's of Shetland and Jameson's Spinrift, they... And Jameson's and Smith, sorry. They, they do 90% of the work. Like, I take no credit for how beautiful the stitches look. It's all the yarn. If you've never tried this yarn before, I highly recommend you get your hands on it. It's a two-ply, but then it, it fluffs up to be like a fingering weight. Uh, thickness and it's woolen spun. It's dyed in the wool, so not this shade, but other shades are incredibly heathered and multi-dimensional. I mean, there's um, a shade here of green that has some shades of yellow and a bit of orange in it. Then there's a pink that has white in it, etc, um, etc. Et like, the, the shades are just so interesting to look at and you can't get that any other way. So, as you can see, this, this is way too big and I am worried about it being unwearably big, but I don't know, this thing is gonna get knit up for ages in the body and then doing the short rows and then sticking and then I can finally try it on. I won't be able to know what this actually looks like as a jacket and then there's a button band to knit up, so it, I don't know if I... I don't know, I don't know. But I'll show you the front because this is quite <laughs> interesting to look at. Uh, my boyfriend Ross was asking, what is this? Is that going to stay? Is that the button band? This is the steak stitches that you can see. <laughs> what is really nice and advantageous about having the beginning of round in the steak is that you see that jog that you get with knitting color work in a spiral. Well, all of these uh, steak stitches are going to get folded inwards once I've cut through the middle. So there actually will never be a visible jog anywhere or a step, because um, because when you knit in the round, it's a spiral, so there, there is a step. If you're cutting in the step, then it gets uh, hidden. So really thrilled with the idea of not having to worry about uh, having a big vis visible line, like a seam line, or anything at the back or on the side, basically. This is just the front, and it will be hidden. So that's perfect, and um, I... I really I can't wait to edit this video because then I'll really see how how great it looks on camera, but um, yeah I mean so so I, I I don't know I was having mixed feelings about being so excited and then artificially killing my excitement by waiting for this kind of deadline of I need to podcast and talk about it so I need to get a healthier mindset surrounding my knits and showing it. Um, the goal was never to knit for the purpose of the podcast; it was to knit and then happening to record it, if I manage. So yeah, um, next steps though. So we're gonna put this back on the needles and then we're gonna work the main pattern, which is a two color pattern in this color and then the granite, this is Heron. It's a kind of like, I guess, yeah, two-toned gray pattern. The chart in Mary Wallen's PDF and book pattern is not the best because the two, it's not a color chart, it's got symbols. The two symbols that she shows for those two colors are not very distinguishable. So what I did was I went on Stitch Fiddle, it's free. I just uh, recreated the chart and I just made it in black and white so that it, it would be very visually obvious what is a stitch in one color and one uh, what is a stitch in the other color. So I'll quickly flash this because I don't want to, you know, like share charts and everything, but basically I, I printed that off um, and this is what I've got. So as you can see, it's a pixel chart and I'm really happy that I did that because I'm not gonna become like I'm, I don't want to strain my eyesight by trying to decipher this repeat which by the way is quite um, different from from these uh, these were so fun to do because basically what you were doing was like three one three one three one like that's so memorizable like I was flying through this and by the time you've reached the end you're doing the next one like you don't have to memorize a big repeat like the bands were like between five rows and seven rows to like sort of complete the motif like um what like the symmetry of it so 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 you know it was very intuitive basically but for the main body it is um 
it's basically 25 stitches wide and then 10 stitches and then 10 rounds tall until you've actually finished the main form and then you've got to stagger the next line over. So technically the entire repeat is 20 rounds tall and you've got to keep going. So I don't know. I mean, I've seen a lot of videos from people having done this pattern and they have said that eventually it is possible to commit the um, chart to memory for, for the section above. And I want to believe in that. I can hopefully trust them. But if not, I've got my little printed chart. I never print charts, but um, yeah. So I guess, I guess my questions to you are, let me know if you would be upset if next time that I talked about that, I was much further and I forgot important things about cho uh, choices I made. And you know, if, if there were longer gaps between me showing you this because I was just working on it as and when I wanted. And then the other question is, is this comically long and large? And am I doing the biggest mistake of my life and I'm going to regret it being so wide? Um, because everybody in the, in the Ravelry comments are saying it's really big, it's really big, but they look great in it afterwards. So yeah, let me know if I'm making a big mistake. The last thing I want to say is the modifications I intend to make is making the sleeves bottom up. Um, Bella from 100 Acre Wool was mentioning that she was choosing to do that because the body is bottom up and the stitches are facing this direction upward for the motif and it would make sense that the sleeves would then follow that same direction ideally and I agree I think it's a really small detail like the little V's facing up or down in the grand scheme of things you know when we're looking at them as pixels aka squares it doesn't matter like it really is reversible but in reality they're not squares they're V's so having that little point uh, upwards or downwards can matter for things like um, just the motifs if they're like lines and, and stuff. So I think I want to follow that too. The only worry I have with making a sleeve bottom up and seaming it afterwards is gauging the length. Um, for the sleeve it's going to be that same motif just pretty much all the way here and then doing that main body uh, color work. Then you seam it uh, I'll probably just cross that bridge when it comes to it, honestly. <laughs> and then the other modification that I want to do is to make the sleeve straight. So Mary Wallen has you pick up stitches at the arm and then decrease and then do the color work um, throughout. I just think I'll not do that. Uh, a few other people on Ravelry have also done straight sleeves and it looks great. So yeah, that's what I intend to do. While I was having that little break with the color work, I was definitely doing a lot of research on YouTube and on Ravelry about everybody's experiences knitting this and all the modifications they were doing. Like, it's, it's really great, like a lot of people have done this cardigan and have demonstrated an insane amount of knowledge and tips and tricks. Like, I am not alone, I'm not feeling alone. A bunch of people are also doing this, like there's one person doing it on the Discord and they're further along than me. And then I think they've already just steaked. And then there's someone on Instagram who's uh, starting hers as well and she's doing hers top down, which is great. So yeah, I, I hope that eventually with time I'll be able to add to that body of knowledge, you know, like I'm taking a lot from the internet, I hope that I can give some back and maybe have my um, own findings or tips or tricks and or just maybe just confirm the tips and tricks of others. I, I really can benefit so much from what other people have shared on this and I, I really hope that I get to share uh, new things too as well as I go on with this project. But yeah, I'm so excited to finally be able to pick this back up. It's, it's, it brought so much joy as I was doing those first two weeks of color work and I can't wait to dive back into it. So that was all from my finished items and works in progress. I have a couple of other works in progress that are hibernating. There's a sweater and a cardigan, um, but I'm really happy I finished those t-shirts. Um, the next plans I guess kind of go hand in hand with what I wanted to talk about before really quickly. I, I was kind of in a knitting slump because I, I finished so many items in a row. Um, at some point I think I finished three things in four days. I did the moonset tea, the Friday tea, the season sweater, and I finished another thing that maybe you know what, is, what, what it is because I uh, talked about it last episode. Where is that, you ask? It's blocking right now. So I'll talk about that in the next podcast episode, but it is finished. That was four finished items in the same month it's really a lot and a lot of them were fingering weight. So it felt really satisfying and gratifying to, to be casting off things, to have the output of my yarn be really large and while the input stayed small in the month of May. 
but it kind of gave me blank page syndrome where I didn't know what to cast on next because um, the world was my oyster and I had all my plans for t-shirts which I think I'm, I'll be taking inspiration from I think I'm gonna cast on the air no the lakes tea by Ozetta next anything for olive cotton merino because it's a yarn I haven't tried yet and I want to try it <laughs> so that's what I'm gonna do in terms of t-shirt and I think I'll be taking that on my trip back home next month because it'll be a nice airport, plane, and uh, trip fingering weight knit. I'll just take that one with me. The other thing I think I'm going to cast on is blouse number one by My Favorite Things Knitwear because it's in pure silk and I always had a joy working with this yarn. Last summer, I'm eager to work on it again. Um, the yarn was kindly gifted by my friend Marlene from Marlene Knits when she came over last, um, last month and uh, she... She, I, I, I asked for this color, it's the Ice Blue by Knitting for Olive and I, I'm really really excited about this, I think this is going to bring so much joy, the same as this is and the same as my um, sort of spring inspired <laughs> cardigan thing is, it's, I'm really having a lot of fun with colors lately, um, colors that I'm, I'm picking and it's, it's probably going to bring a lot of joy to work on this blouse because it's a different shape than usual, different construction, color is great yarn is great. I've gauge swatched with some uh, pure silk I had left over from a different project because I'm kind of playing yarn chicken with the ice blue and this gauge swatch is first of all very slanted. See what I mean with the yarn not having a twist to it. It has a tendency to lean. Uh, I think it's I'm not doing anything like this is how it lies. So or lays. So anyway this is not on gauge at all, like it's way too loose for some reason, like again, I just don't understand why I can't get small stitches. Uh, knitting, knitting product. My favorite things knitwear recommends a 5mm needle, this is 4.5, I think I'm gonna go down to a 4 and cast on the extra small blouse and then see what happens. Um, I just, like what else am I meant to do? I'm not gonna do a knit on um, 2.5 millimeters if not necessary. So yeah, uh, I'll, I'll be casting on that quite soon and hopefully share some progress pics on Instagram. And then uh, I had asked on Instagram, you know, I'm going through a bit of a knitting slump, any ideas, what should I cast on next? And yeah, people were saying, do a t-shirt, maybe something in pure silk, and then people were also recommending, you know, like, oh, do the Maggie cardigan or do something in cashmere. And that was actually kind of my secret wish was yeah I really wanted to do the Maggie cardigan when it came out I was so excited I was browsing through the Cardiff cashmere colors there was actually a sale on Etika yarns for Mother's Day so I took advantage of that got free shipping got a big discount on the yarn and uh, it arrived really quickly so again I don't know why I'd, I just didn't I didn't cast on right away even though I've had this yarn like in my flat for uh, over a week but uh, yeah, I wanted to show you that color because, again, it is just marvelous. So this is the yarn. This is Cardiff Cashmere in the color Funny, I think. It's one of their new colors, I think. They, they haven't really advertised new shades, but when you go on their website, that one says new on it. So yeah, this is so pretty and it's going to be a Maggie cardigan and yeah I really hope to be casting that on and I'll be able to show you that and the new blouse number one soon in the next podcast. I think it's really exciting again podcasting wise the fact that I finished a lot of things that were on the go for a while and now it's kind of like a new season like I like to think of my podcast as like a season where um, we, we clear a lot of things of the needles and then now we have this whole new batch of new projects and um, yeah just novelty it's it's great so uh, yeah I'm, I'm so 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 happy that I chose this color um, obviously I like the gray Maggie cardigan that Petite Knit sports in her pattern photos but this is so much better <laughs> so hopefully I'll be finishing this before my birthday and then wearing the Maggie cardigan in cashmere for my birthday that's the plan but it's not a hard deadline and we'll see what happens so I think that's it. I am actually starving right now and I hope that you couldn't hear my stomach grumbling for the last 10 minutes, but uh, I'm, I'm really happy. I, I feel really good about all the projects that I've finished and the ones I'm about to start. Um, it's just actually, yeah, life has been really, really busy. I've been going through a lot of like big life things and decision making and, and researching. I've had so many things to look into which then made my knitting time just less available because I actually spent so much time on Google and on the internet um, evenings after work and on the weekends and it really hasn't left me a lot of space for knitting 
Um, and then that's what I was saying, where, where I was, my mind was just working too fast and I felt like if I was working in Stockinet, I just couldn't focus because I'd, I'd be thinking about other things. That's why I kind of wanted to work on the fair aisle to actually force myself to relax because I'd have to switch off my mind and work on the color work chart. So um, yeah, the, life is still busy. So I'm, I'm happy that I'm going to have my knitting hobby as a way to unwind and spend time for myself. It's good to have a bit of balance. Like I was saying last episode, I was looking forward to spending all that time with friends and outdoors. Sadly, it hasn't really been the case this month of the weather but we've got tangled gala shields next week actually if you see me of course come and say hi talk to me um tell me your username or if we've talked before uh, so i can you know uh, put a face to the name and uh i really look for forward to it ross is going to come with me and i hope we're going to have a great time there's a, a market happening on the same day on saturday the day I'm going is Saturday, by the way. Um, so I know that we're going to probably have a stroll around at lunchtime and visit the booth of the local makers and, and bakers. So that's super exciting. And I remember last time we had an ice cream uh, and it was really good weather. So fingers crossed it's the same this 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 time. I'm really looking forward to seeing all my nitty friends. There's a bunch of them coming and uh, catching up with, with people and hopefully, yeah, having new conversations and meeting new people. So that's exciting. And then I've got um, a trip to Belgium later, but I think I'm going to catch up with you first at some point before that. So yeah, let me know what you think of this video, if there was anything that uh, piqued your interest or if you have any input on any of the things that I've mentioned. Uh, of course, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on any of this. Hope that you enjoyed whatever you were knitting on during this podcast episode. Uh, as always, I hope an hour is, is good enough because um, I, I know personally, I, I watch podcasts that are an hour and a half long. I don't mind. I can just knit for longer. And yeah, if you like this video, then don't hesitate to give it a like. And if you really liked this video, then you can even subscribe. Um, maybe share this on your Instagram story or talk about it with your nitty friends. Uh, I'd really like to maybe get to 10,000 subscribers uh, before my birthday. That's like a hypothetical, arbitrary milestone to reach at an arbitrary date, but you know, I don't know, uh, um, I vibe with numbers. So yeah, uh, take excellent care wherever you are and happy knitting everybody. Bye!